Hi, I'm Dr. Hart Pinto. Let's review clinical governance. This is a high yield topic for both medical exams and interviews at every grade, whether you're a junior doctor moving to specialty training or searching for consultant posts. So you need a comprehensive understanding of the definition and key components of clinical governance. This will help you formulate a clear and structured answer tailored to your own experiences, ensuring you score highly. So let's get into it. Clinical governance is a framework through which NHS organisations are accountable for continuously improving quality of their services and safeguarding high standards of care by creating an environment in which excellence can flourish. This definition aims to encompass three key characteristics. Firstly, demonstrating high standards of care, transparent responsibility and accountability for upholding these standards, and the strive for constant improvement. It is important to know and reference in an exam or interview setting that clinical governance is based upon seven pillars. I find it easy to remember this using the mnemonic parties. Patients and public, clinical audit, risk management, teaching and education, information and technology, effectiveness and research, including evidence-based medicine, and staff management. Other examples of mnemonics exist, including pirates and ear tips. The important thing is to choose one that's memorable for you and stick to it. So, now let's break down each of the seven pillars. Patients and public involvement. The first pillar aims to ensure that services available are appropriate for the population that they serve. One way of assessing how good services are is to reflect on feedback from patients and the public population that we serve. Feedback comes from a variety of sources, including patient questionnaires, feedback recorded from patient advice and liaison service, PALS for short, and feedback from members of the public who serve as governors on the hospital boards. From this, we can implement positive change within the service we provide, which will make services more relevant and hopefully improve outcomes for patients. Audit. We will cover clinical audit in more detail in a subsequent video, but the key point here is to ensure current clinical practice is continually monitored in and meets to predetermined standards. Audits allow us to identify areas where improvements can be made, make changes and see if our changes have improved the care that we provide. Hopefully, when we re-audit and reassess our practice against those previous set standards, we'll see a significant improvement. Risk management. As with anything in life, sometimes things go wrong and medical care is no exception. However, there is a significant risk of harm. The aim of risk management is to have robust systems to minimize, monitor and reduce the potential for or impact of unfortunate events. Where errors do occur, we must learn from these events. For us to do this, the health service must provide a blame-free culture, ensuring anyone can report mistakes without fear of persecution. These can be logged as incidences where management and clinical staff can work together to perform risk assessments, identifying the likelihood of events occurring and what the likely outcome will be. Training and education. Healthcare professionals must keep clinical knowledge and practical skills up to date. The health service should support continuous professional development, allocating time for study leave, attending conferences or courses, and completion of specialty examinations. Trainee doctors must also partake in regular assessments to demonstrate their progress. Annual appraisals for all healthcare staff ensure weaknesses can be identified and new opportunities for professional development can be highlighted. Information and technology. Healthcare services must ensure trusts comply with current data protection regulations. We've looked at these in a previous lecture. To do this, hospitals and staff must ensure data is accurate and stored securely, protecting the confidentiality of patients. Effectiveness and research. Clinical effectiveness means ensuring that the best possible outcome is sought for a particular patient. We do this by adopting new practices based on a strong evidence base, which can improve the quality of care for our patients. In many cases, we may choose to push this envelope by conducting clinical research. 
Here, we're aiming to develop new and better ways to detect, diagnose, treat and prevent disease. Finally, staff management ensures that staff are being utilised to their full potential. We must ensure that the right people are being recruited to the correct roles, where they can be motivated and continue developing services for the benefit of our patients. Where performance concerns are identified, staff should be encouraged and supported to improve. Keeping staff happy and supported in their roles encourages retention of staff. So if you remember your definition and the seven pillars, I'm sure you'll ace that exam or the interview. Thank you for watching. If you've enjoyed this video, please don't forget to like, subscribe and comment down below. Please let us know where you're studying from because our team really loves to know. See you next time.